Hello and welcome. Accelerated grid theming using 960. My name is Todd. This is Nathan. Nathan is a designer and developer at Fellowship Tech, and he is a self-proclaimed uh, Drupal noob. Uh, and I am Todd Neenkirk. I'm a co-founder of Four Kitchens. Uh, I'm a designer and developer, and uh, I am expertish. So I'm going to hand this over to Nathan because Nathan invented 960GS. Uh, so a round of applause. It's uh, uh, very innovative and it's definitely going to sort of change the way that we approach uh, theming and design and prototyping. Uh, at least I hope so. So Nathan. Yeah. Okay, so uh, first off, what is a grid system? Um, let me get all this up on the screen. Um, a grid system is, you know, a practice of doing layout that is a throwback. So we hear that ooh, grid systems are new for the web, but they're actually really like old school when it comes to print. Um, you know, you had to work with the printing press. You could only lay things out in a certain way that the machine was built. So you had to kind of embrace what you had to, to work with. Um, so uh, we had kind of a movement in the 40s and 50s. If you've seen the movie Helvetica, they describe it as like, there's all these nuptial fonts and like script and it's terrible and it's this Coca-Cola ad. Fast forward to the 1960s, where you have the Helvetica comes out and the Bauhaus kind of uh, design movement, and the ad there in the movie says, drink Coke, period, any questions, of course not, it's in Helvetica. <laughs> so that's kind of the mentality of the grid system, is you're going to keep things aligned, keep things organized. Uh, so typographic the grids, we talked about um, kind of the, I can't pronounce this, so I'll just say the English version, the new typography, uh, it questioned the relevance of kind of the conventional wisdom and what had been been before in the previous decades. So they, they devised a flexible system that was um, flexible enough, but yet gave you something as a starting point to keep things aligned correctly as you jumped into design. So this is a, you know, a century ago. Modernists looked to build a new aesthetic by deriving beauty from the innate qualities of the machine. So it's not rage against the machine, it's work within the constraints of the system that you're using. Um, championing standardization, you know, so um, uh, I like to think of when World War II was going on, we were sending over plane parts with our American standard, and the British would have to weld over it, drill their own holes again, and have their British standard, then they'd get the planes in the air. Horribly inefficient, so finally they kind of adopted our standard, and we you know, were able to get planes flying a lot quicker. Uh, so today, web designers, we as web designers, have turned to grid-based systems in order to derive beauty from the innate qualities, innate qualities of the browser. So, uh, rather than fight against what the browser can do, we are championing standardization to work within what browsers allow us to do. So, 16 years later, we're finally getting it as designers, which is kind of cool. Uh, grid systems on the web usually takes the form of a framework. Uh, framework really is maybe doing too much justice to, it, to what 960 is. It's more lightweight than that. I consider it um, just kind of like a, a code snippet library of, of things you can use to make a grid, you know, so it's not like a full on. Uh, you know, things that's going to do everything for you, but at the same time, it's not going to make those design decisions for you that you should be left up to as a designer. Um, so examples of frameworks, Ruby on Rails is a well-known Ruby framework. It's like the Ruby framework. Uh, jQuery, of course, is a JavaScript framework uh, inside Drupal itself. And Drupal itself can be considered a uh, web application framework. Um, it includes many APIs. I've heard that you guys love APIs in the Drupal community, and I'm just kind of getting my feet wet. But I like what I've seen so far, because uh, there's consistency to the approach for the most part. Uh, so CSS frameworks applies the same principle to web design. Um, provides standardized rules and shortcuts for browser resets, typography, navigation, and print style. And when applied to the, to the web for uh, layouts, we have what's called a grid system, which we've touched on. Um, this is my friend Jeff Croft. He's a designer that works in Seattle. And he's basically saying that if you're railing against frameworks, you're probably trying to drum up false job security because um, you want to be the one that hand coded every single time. And I likened that to the Luddites. Uh, there was this whole group of people that were textile um, weavers, basically. They would make fabric by hand. And then the, uh, the cotton gin and some technology started being invented that allowed a loom to be mechanical. So rather than embrace that and say, wow, look at these awesome tools, we can get things done way quicker, they broke into the factory at night and smashed the machines, thinking, surely we will have jobs. And then the next week, they fixed the machine. You know. So rather than fight against uh, these frameworks that let us get a quicker start, we as people that already know how to code that by hand can get even further out ahead. So why use a grid system? Saves time, saves money, and reduces frustration. I don't know about you, but I just got tired of every project. Okay, I'm going to 
zero things out, margin padding zero. I'm going to go through and I'm going to have some floats in here and there. What did I name it this time? Did I name it content main? Did I name it sidebar? Like, ah, oh, man. So it reduces the amount of, uh, sorry, reduces the amount of CSS and markup you need to duplicate each time. You can start from, you know, starting from scratch often means having ingredients that are pre-made at your disposal. So if I make a cake from scratch, I'm not going and harvesting the grain. I've got flour in a bag, you know. So I think of a, uh, you know, a framework as kind of flour in the bag. You, you can still build as, whatever you want as uniquely as you want, but you start from a, a better starting point. I think of front-end development as a multi-bodied hydra. This is a picture of a multi-headed hydra. Uh, in web development, there's only one head, HTML. It's all got to go through the browser, you know. So it doesn't matter to me if it's hooking up to Java or .NET or PHP or whatever. Uh, so to me, as being a front-end guy, I, I like being there because it means that hopefully I'm always going to have at least, you know, some type of job uh, because it all comes to the choke point of the browser. Uh, so you can stop fixing, start designing things. So you, you don't have to... Um, where you as much about browser bugs, at least not in the grid, when you're starting things out. It'll, uh, out of the box, work in IE6 at, at, at the, the bare minimum, so um, you don't have to have a whole lot of hacks. And then it's, it's well tested, so if you're putting it through its paces and you, you file a bug report or you email me and I, I can fix it, then you know, that's, that's a bug that's not out there for somebody else to stumble over. Um, so my boss at EMC, when I worked there, would always tell us embrace constraints. And here's an example of embracing constraints. You've got room enough for three letters, so OPM. We hey, come in. We're open. Um, so you got to embrace the constraints of the browser and what you have to work with. Um, so even netbooks will, at the bare minimum, support 1024 pixels wide. So we can, with reliability, say we can use 960, and that gives us enough breathing room on either side within pretty much any uh, any monitor. And despite the many advances in web technology, it's all just rectangles. I heard Andy Budd speak a while ago. He wrote CSS Mastery. And he said, you know, I just played a video game with like ragdoll physics and anti-aliasing on the fly and fog and shadows and, and we still count round corners and IE, you know. And I was like, it's so true. You know? <laughs> we can like crunch so many numbers like the prediction is in the next 20 years a computer will be built that is under $1,000 that surpasses the computational power of the human brain and yet we're stuck with like flow it here and clear. <laughs> uh, I cleared it the wrong way so now this browser is going to do it wrong. Anyways. So you can stop deconstructing CSS. If you are working on a team, you use a grid system where, you know, it doesn't have to be 960, but if you have settled on a framework you're going to use internally, you write something, then it's going to make sense to the developer you're working with because you're both working on the same code base. Uh, to me, if you hand code everything every single time, it's kind of like playing Marco Polo. You know, even Michael Phelps, as a world-class athlete, world-class swimmer, needs that black line painted along the bottom of the pool so he can stay in a straight line. He knows where he's going. He's going to make it to and from the, f the quickest pa uh, possible uh, distance. So to me, that's like using a grid system. There's no reason you can't kind of splash over the edges every now and then, but for the most part, it gives you a starting point. Now, this is a quote by Christian Heilman. He's a senior developer at Yahoo. He's basically saying, clients don't care about like how cool your code is or whether or not it was you know, from scratch or not. They care about the end product. And the end product, if it can get done quicker, is going to save them money. You know, They're not going to have to uh, hire a developer to follow up your work afterwards. And, Say, hey, how did he hand code this stuff from scratch? If you use a, a documented uh, framework, it's easier for people to come at the speed to maintain it. So, how do grid systems work? Um, this is a, a shot of the 12 column grid in uh, 960. 960, you can use either 12 or 16 columns. Um, I did a one off 15 column grid for an agency in Dallas that was doing some work for Dell, and they're like, sweet, you should put that back in. And it averaged out to like 47 pixel wide columns, and I'm like, I'm not going to put that on anybody, man. Like, you know, multiples of 47, no, no way, no. <laughs> so, um, so basically, they're called columns, but there's no reason that you can't have content span columns. So I think of it like when we went to World War II, you know, we, we declared war. Uh, the, the paper that, that, that next morning, it didn't say, oh, the United States has declared war in very small print and had a little picture of somebody having, you know, it said war. That's all it said above the fold. And, you know, it was so important that it took up all that, all that width. So that's what the 960 lets you do is you can, Span as many columns as you want, or you can break it down to really granular level. Uh, so the gutters are combined margin of 10 pixels on either side. So you have 10 pixels on the far left, 10 pixels on the far right, and then they combine in the middle to create 20 pixels. With only a 10 pixel gutter, um, some other frameworks which I won't rag on by name, um, if you end a sentence with a period and then you start another sentence in the next line, it's tough to tell as you're reading if that ends here and that's a double space 
and it continues on in the next column, and it's text going all the way across, or if it's actually wrapping. So 20 to me is the, the minimum gutter that you want to have. One of the things that's really beautiful about 960 is that uh, it actually utilizes the space between these column widths uh, to create real margins uh, between page regions. Uh, other grid systems usually just sort of create these uh, areas purely to uh, uh, create your own margin within that. But this has this, uh, that space built in. Yeah, I think if I were to do, you know, if I wanted more columns, I would just get rid of gutters entirely and just have empty columns that were 20 pixels and the columns themselves would be 20. But I think that's almost too small. But yeah, like you're saying, you don't want to have to have a gutter and then an empty column just to have enough comfortable space in between the two. Um, so a grid CSS should be lean and efficient. Hopefully it is. Uh, it's 3.6K when compressed. Uh, it's versatile and reusable, and it ensures consistent behavior even in our favorite browser, IE6. Woo! Um, so uh, you want to wrap things first in a div element, um, or, I mean, this could really be anything, but you know, pretty much div is kind of the, the go-to tag. Um, you can float things within, with inside that. So if you have a uh, grid eight, you can put two grid fours in there. Um, they can, you know, can contain uh, other grid units. Um, so let's see, what, what can grid systems look like? Pretty much, you know, pretty much anything you want. Here's some examples that Todd has put together. Um, just flip through these real quick. Mr. Sample, you know, Three column uh, thing. Well, I don't want to say column. I'll say region because the word column here is a bit overloaded. Uh, here's your three region: you know, left sidebar, right sidebar, content center. Uh, and then the next one here, we can get uh, two on the left. Uh, and if you really want to go crazy, if you're like a postmodern web designer, <laughs> you know, so you, you can do practically anything. You could actually use the 960 cr to create art. <laughs> <laughs> New York Times website. Yep. <laughs> So, um, so yeah, I mean, it lets you do a variety of things, pretty flexible. Mm -hmm. um, so how 960.js uh, works. What is it? Um, some of these are holdover slides from Todd's previous presentation. So it was invented by me, Nathan Smith. Uh, the premise is ideally suited to rapid prototyping. So when um, June Park, who did the 960 Drupal theme, approached me, he said, hey, what are you going to do for right-to-left languages? I'm like, what? <laughs> You know, so what are you going to do for like content first, so I can switch, switch, you know, the the, the visual layout, but not the source order? I'm like, what? <laughs> I'm like, you're smarter than me, man. So, anyways, I started it to do prototyping, uh, and it kind of grew into kind of production ready. Um, but I don't purport to have any original thoughts. So this is uh, inspiration. This is Koi Vin, the design director of the New York Times. Um, he's big in the grids. This is uh, Cameron Mole, he's the lead designer for the, the Mormon Church, and he wrote an article that was called Gritting the 960, and he, he basically showed that 960 was a highly divisible number and was a really good base number to work with. So I started doing that in my own, uh, in my own comps and gradually worked myself towards having a code base that later became 960. And then Brandon Schauer, I hope I said that right. Brandon Schauer is an information architect at uh, Adaptive Path, and they are big fans of paper prototyping. Um, so part of the part of what you can download with 960 is a PDF you can print out that has either 12 or 16 columns. You can have basically one browser window. You can have like four or up to nine browser windows on the page. Um, so I thought, you know, we we're sketching all the time. Anyways, what if we sketched as IAs? We sketched things that were going to be ready to be designed in a column template that came as Photoshop template that also maps directly to a CSS file. So that's that's kind of the sum total of 960. Um, June also told me, he's like, man, it's really cool you license it under GPL so it can go into Drupal. And I was like, I like jQuery, and basically I copied the, the copyrights in there for it. So it's <laughs> serendipitous that it works with GPL licensing. Um, so then there's kind of a list of some of the templates you can get. If you're into open source design, uh, Inkscape is a free uh, SVG editor, so I've got templates for you guys. Um, tech specs, so as we, we talked about, there's two uh, versions, nine, or, uh, in 960, it's 12 and 16 columns. Um, you can have them both on the same page, or you can split them out. Here's the 12 column. Um, you can see up here there's basically 10 pixels of margin on each um, region, column, oh, right column. Area. Yeah, we'll call these columns. And so that stacks to be 20 pixels in between. This 10 pixel here is basically so that if your browser is a little bit too small, let me say it's 800 by 600, uh, if you didn't have this, your text would touch your browser chrome or it touched the far left side of the screen. And that's what I ran into when I was using Blueprint. Um, I was doing a client doing some work for a client that said, well, you have to use a grid system that's already out there and documented so our developers can take and run with it. So it's either that or YUI. Um, and I started using Blueprint and they hated that, it, that their content touched here for people that had 
uh, 800 by 600. They didn't mind that it was wider and people had to scroll, but they wanted it to be at least readable uh, within 800 by 600. So as you can see, same thing for uh, 16 column versions. The columns are just a little narrower, but the gutters remain 20 pixels. Um, so you can use both, uh, or you can use just one or the other. So that's kind of 12 and 16 together, and ooh, they overlay. And so if you have 12 and 16, you can still have the appearance of one unified grid in the page if you stick to divisions of quarters and halves. Uh, one thing that 12 allows you to do that 16 doesn't just have things split out in the multiples of three, which is kind of cool. So halves and quarters. So there we go. And if that's not your thing, then you can, you know, there's a lot of other numbers you can divide things by. Uh, so you can go to it. <laughs> Choose one. Right? Um, yeah, so apologies to Jacine who her talk yesterday said, don't give me any bleeping underscores. <laughs> uh, I didn't code it thinking Drupal was going to pick up and run with it, so I use underscores just because for my own brain that's what worked. Uh, the Drupal way, however, I've been told has dashes instead of underscores, so it's not that hard of a finding the place for those that hate it. Um, so in, in all the examples here, we're going to use dashes, even though if you were to download that 60 GS, you're going to see underscores. So. Yeah. yeah. Watch so out. It's not a religious thing. So. Right. All right. We'll do it the right way for, for this presentation. <laughs> so, uh, Are you planning to change it? Um, I might take some of the implementations of the push and pull methodology, but I don't want to change it because there's already guys using 960 in WordPress, like Woo Themes uses it for all their commercial themes, and I don't want to throw a monkey wrench in what they're doing. I might have maybe simultaneous versions that I maintain at some point, <laughs> but yeah. Um, so, let me see, so you can wrap things in the container. Um, I don't know, somebody yesterday mentioned Stubbornella, she's a, I forget her real name, but that's her handle at Yahoo, and she had a, a presentation on uh, object-oriented design, and she has her own grid system that she's kind of pushing. Um, hers say, like, grid three of five, so that tells you how wide it's going to be within five total, it takes up three. This is kind of the opposite, you define it at your container level, I've got 12 total that can ever be, and then within there you just type in, like, grid one, grid two, up to grid the exact amount of the width, so up to grid 12 and container 12. Um, so the grid widths can be determined as a one descendant selector level. So within grid 12, um, grid 1 is 60 pixels wide, within, or sorry, within container 12, grid 1 is 60 pixels wide, within container 16, grid 1 is 40 pixels wide. Um, so you can kind of see how that, that works there. Um, you can combine things within the uh, container there. Uh, prefixes and suffixes. Let's say you wanted to have an empty column for whatever reason. Um, you can do that by having prefix dash or suffix dash, however many empty columns you want before or after something. So this is how that would work. It's worth pointing out that, uh, that one of the, uh, the really cool things about this kind of grid system is you'll notice in, the, uh, in all of these examples that there are no wrapping divs for each row. Usually in web design, you know, just to make sure everything's nice and neat, uh, you're going to have your row one, row two, row three. You don't have to do that in grid design. Uh, you just simply say, uh, we've got a, a grid three, grid four, prefix one, suffix one, uh, uh, grid three, and that adds up to 12. So the next thing you add is going to float to the next line. So really that effectively creates a second row. If you really wanted to make sure that it, it broke in case one of them was taller and you're worried about weird float stacking, you could do the clear block class uh, that people right. has. Clear block or in Drupal 7, it is being renamed to clear fix uh, properly. Yeah. So that is included with 960. Um, you can have multiple rows, so you can have one span across, like if you're, we're going to war, you want to type of layout. Um, you can have multiple uh, rows, but there's no need to put each one in its own row, <coughs> you're saying? Right. Uh, yeah, this is just an example of the, uh, the markup to achieve the previous slide. So it's, yeah. it's that clean, and there's no actual division between rows. There's just the comments in there, so you can see where, where those things fall into place. Um, you can also have uh, stacked grids within uh, a container. Um, but then, whoops, each one has 10 pixels of margin on each, either side, so we've just doubled our margin, pushed our cool sidebar right. It's down below the sidebar left, so not exactly where we expected it. Uh, enter the alpha and omega fixes for broken nesting. Um, in Blueprint, every last column you have to put the class of last. Uh, I didn't like doing that because rarely, you know, rarely do I have nested things, so I'd rather put the burden on when I have nested grids than having to do it every time I just have a row. 
Um, so what we do is we add either class alpha or class omega to remove the either right or left margin if they're nested. So in this case, we kill off the margins for the children and then they can you know, display there. I've had people ask me why not just use uh, first, first child or last child. Um, so I'll kind of address that. This, is, this would be first child and then this would be last child, but we need this, we need to address that as well. So first and last child aren't necessarily your first and last of every row because you have several within a container. I want to point something out here real quick before we go to the next slide. So uh, once you create this uh, grid six here, you're kind of like, uh, you're in a, a new grid world and your maximum width is six. So when you do a three and a three, the next thing you do is going to drop below that always. So uh, the alpha and the omega here and here uh, ensure that the little margin is removed and then a single class that would span the entire width of a nested grid takes both alpha and omega simultaneously. Yeah, because it's both the first, it's both the first and the last thing in its own row. It, it is a grid six itself. Um, let me see. Oh. So um, I've had people say, "Why do you name it alpha and omega? Isn't that kind of religious?" Blah blah blah. I'm like, dude, I don't, you know, Drupal has class last in there already. I didn't want to, you know, step on anybody with the naming conventions. Um, this guy summed it up for me. He's a designer at one club, and he's like, in the time you can argue the relevence of naming conventions, hey, look at me, I just built a 16 column layout. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so, so normally when I talk about 960, I'm used to having to fight that, but then I looked at Drupal and it's like, body class, log in, no sidebar, and I'm like, sweet, I think these people get it. <laughs> so I'm preaching to the choir here. Um, additional resources, there's a 960 gridder in Bookmarklet. Uh, if you just go to 960.gs, they're pretty prominent links. Um, so like we are saying, if, if the 12 and 16 column don't do it for you, or you want it like 1080 wide instead of 960, you can configure that visually, type in different numbers, and then it, it will generate a CSS value for you to take and download. Um, one thing you will have to do is find and replace on the underscores. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, so now let's get into the 960 theme. Um, I'll hand it over to Todd yeah. here. I'm the Drupal new, and he's the Drupal expert-ish. Okay. Uh, so, the 960 theme spelled out, 960, is uh, Drupal's implementation of 960 GS. And, I'm sorry, it's uh, even better than the original, but uh, we mean that well. Julian's uh, really smart. <laughs> he is really a very, very smart guy. And uh, this, this was developed by uh, uh, June Park, D. Vessel. Yeah. This guy's brilliant. Uh, you should check out some of his work. Uh, we did not build this theme. I believe he's one of the maintainers with the develop module now. So right. He's uber smart. Yes, he is. Okay, so all about 960. Uh, it's a Drupal port of 960 GS, developed this. Yeah, I already went over this. Uh, now, it's intended to be a base theme, and uh, usually when I give this presentation elsewhere, I have to sort of explain the whole base theme thing, but we all get it, right? It's a base theme. Uh, it's something that provides no <coughs> styling whatsoever. This is simply positional CSS. Uh, and it is currently a candidate for Drupal 7 core, so please, please, please follow the debate somewhere on GDO. That's linked. You can download this presentation at fourkitchens.com slash presentations, uh, and it will have the proper link there. Otherwise, you can just Google it. But please do weigh in. Uh, it would be really neat to have some grid systems to choose from so that we can just pile them on, and then maybe we don't even have to think of them in terms of base themes and sub-themes anymore and have all of the baggage that goes along with that, but just you know, be able to select what kind of grid do you want in this theme. Uh, blueprint, 960. Brainstorm, yeah, 960. <laughs> we choose 960. Uh, okay, so improvements. Uh, it allows content-first layout for push and pull classes. Uh, dynamic grid widths based on context, and I'll explain that in a moment. Debugging tools and some grid visualization, so you get some uh, uh, overlays and, and you can see where the content is actually lining up and if it's lining up properly. And right-to-left language support, which just sounds so awesome. Uh, I, I don't work with RTL sites, uh, but Wow, if anybody does and they test this, can you please let us know because we want to make sure that it really does work properly. It appears to, but um, you know, we're a little ignorant uh, on, uh, when it comes to RTL layouts. So content first layout, it's a design convention uh, in which the content is output as close to the top of the market as possible. So it needs to be at the top of the, uh, the page source, uh, definitely before the output of all sidebars. And some designers even believe that it needs to be placed before the navigation if you have a horizontal navigation just below the header, for example. Uh, so why is that important? Why, why should we care? Uh, there are two reasons. 
the first is accessibility. Uh, a, a lot of people who are sighted who have screen readers or other applications don't want to have to cycle through possibly you know, 50, 100 links in your left-hand sidebar just to get to the content, especially if you haven't put in skip links or something at the top of the page. They're going to have to cycle through all of this stuff just to get to the content. So minimizing the amount of stuff they have to traverse just to get to the relevant information is very important. There's also a very strong uh, SEO argument that can be made about placing content as high up in the source uh, as possible. That way, uh, search engines, when they're spidering the source, they get to that relevant stuff very, very quickly. Uh, and unfortunately, this can be very difficult to achieve when you're dealing with one or more left-hand columns. Because as we know, the easiest way to get columns to act like columns is to float them left. Uh, but if we want those things to, if we want the content to be first, it would appear on the left, and all of those sidebars would appear on the right. So enter the push and pull classes. Uh, you would take a, uh, a region, say a, uh, uh, a content area, the main area of the page, and you would push it to the right, and then you would pull the sidebar to the left. So you push and pull these things into place. They use the same naming convention as grid, prefix, and suffix. Uh, so you have push x and pull x, where x is the number of columns that you have to move it. So here is an example. Uh, I'm going to have to get up front here, point this stuff out. All right, so uh, here we have our, um, our container. Uh, so we know that this is a 12 column layout. We have content. This is the ideal layout, by the way. This is how it should look uh, when you view the source. The content is the first thing that you see, uh, and it's a grid six. And then we have our sidebar left, but obviously, if you float all these things left, the order is going to be content left right. But what we want is left content right. So enter push and pull. Now, the thing to remember, because this gets a little complicated, is you have to uh, match the numbers of the thing that you're, you're swapping it with. So when you have a content of grid six, you will need to pull the other thing six into place. If this thing is three wide, you're going to have to push it three to wind up uh, where it should be. You think of it like swapping the places of Think of it like swapping the places of Lego pieces. So this is six wide, so I'm going to swap it over here, and I'm moving this over one, two, three, four, five, six. You know, Lego units, the little circles. You know. Exactly. So here we have the same example without any push or pull classes. We have our, uh, our content here, and our left sidebar and our right sidebar, and they're not where they should be. So when we add the push and pull, these things right here, they swap. Dynamic grid widths. So earlier when I said uh, we have uh, uh, dynamic grid widths based on context, what I'm talking about are regions in Drupal. So we've all worked with Garland where if you put a block in the right-hand region, in the right-hand column, and that block is empty and it vanishes, then the, uh, the content area will automatically stretch to fill that empty space. There's not just a blank column left there. Currently, uh, without adding uh, a little bit of functionality, you would have to do all of this in your, uh, your page TPL file. You'd have to have all of this logic like, all right, if right, then I want it to be this wide. But if not, then this wide. And then I'm going to have to push and pull different values. That's when tables start to look pretty good. That's when tables start to look, look like a good option. So uh, luckily, dVessel uh, has come up with this brilliant uh, piece of code that, that handles all of this stuff. So uh, in this example, let's say you have a 363. Uh, you want it to become a 3.9 if the right-hand column is empty. Pretty common stuff. So there's this function called ns, short for uh, 960, not Nathan's method. Which I thought was for my initials, but <laughs> June told me otherwise. <laughs> so yeah, you can't have a function called 960 in numbers. So. Right, yeah, exactly. And that's also why the theme is called 960 and I uh, All right, so <coughs> find it in template PHP. Uh, everybody can still hear me, right? Because I'm going to have to like point at things. Uh, all right, so here is a, a typical call to NS. We have uh, some kind of a class. That could be push, pull, grid, prefix, suffix, and X. Uh, we have region, Y, region, Z, and so on. You can continue passing in all kinds of variables. Uh, so the first call, or the first variable passed to NS is our default value. And that's default both in terms of what is the type of thing you're messing with. Is it grid, prefix, suffix, push, pull? and the numerical value that is the width of the, the, the column width. Then we have pairs. So we would have a region, and that's paired with a certain value that is subtracted from this. Uh, sorry, that subtracts from this. So x, y, and z are all width values. 
And the class, like I said, grid, prefix, suffix, push, pull. And region can be any theme region. So let's say you have left, right, or left sidebar, right sidebar, header for some reason. Uh, it's simply that variable that's generated a template preprocess page and sent to your uh, page TPL file to, uh, just simply to be printed. And you can use as many pairs as you want. So here is the call from uh, 960's default page TPL file. There are three calls to NS. There's this first one here, right? And then there's another one here. And the last one is for the left sidebar. So the first one is saying grid 16, then left four, right three, and then we're you know, concatenating that, push four, and then like, oh, that looks weird, four. Uh, and then the last one is for the left-hand sidebar. So let's deconstruct this. Uh, here's the, the first couple of calls. Uh, yeah. Uh, so right now we're going to mess with this first one. That's this one right here. So we have our bulk width of grid 16. Now it says grid, so now we're, we know we're dealing with grid, which simply defines a thing that is a div that is of a certain width that's floated left. So it's the thing that just sort of flows onto the page. Uh, then we have a pair that says left four, and then another pair that says right and three. What this pair is saying is, if the left sidebar is present on the page, subtract four from the default width. If the right sidebar is present on the page, subtract three from the default width. So in other words, your default value is grid 16, so we're dealing with widths here. Uh, if left is there, it's gonna become grid 12. And if right is also there, it's gonna become grid nine. So that nine plus four plus, uh, I'm sorry, nine plus, uh, yeah, nine plus four, four plus three becomes 16. It still fills the whole width. Now here is the second call. Because this is uh, the main column and it needs to be in the middle, we also have to manipulate push-pull. Because if the left-hand sidebar is not there, there's no reason to push-pull anything. It just flows right into place and the right sidebar exists on the right-hand side. So uh, this is where it gets a little complicated, but it's like so beautiful in its simplicity. Here is our default push value of four. And then if left sidebar is not present, hence the bang, subtract four from the push value. This results in no push because four minus four is zero. So again, normally we'd have to push four in order to bring the main column four places to the right so that we can then send the left sidebar over. If the left sidebar isn't there, forget it, do nothing. So here is the sidebar left. It's doing a pull 12 right three, meaning our default pull value is 12. It has to move 12 across. If the right sidebar is present, you subtract three to get nine. Kind of feel like John Matt. <laughs> go here, you go there, run around. Exactly, exactly. It's, it's very strategic. I have, okay. a question, I have a question though. Why are you paying attention to the right sidebar? Don't you really care about the, why, why does the right sidebar matter in that case? Uh, let's see here. It wouldn't matter for, for the push pull, it would only matter for the width. So that you'd want your content to, to take up as much space as possible. Whereas the left, it depends. If the left is there, then we do want to do the push-pull, swap the places, right. and if not, it can just move over to the left as it normally would the content here. Okay. Uh, so you can see 960 in action right now at 960.fkdemos.com. There are a bunch of different pages you can just click through, uh, see the 12 column implementation, 16 column implementation, uh, and it also demonstrates how push-and-pull classes are used and how the NS function uh, works in action. So uh, let's talk about implementing a grid-based layout. Sometimes you do not want to use a grid. What? <laughs> that's almost like it was scripted. Uh, all right. It actually wasn't, but that's okay. Uh, so implementing a grid will probably be impossible if your site's layout uses irregular column sizes, meaning left-hand column is going to be 231 and content's going to be 487 and you know, just all kinds of oddball numbers. If it has irregular margins or gutters, if we can't just sort of agree on, say, 20 or 30 or some kind of nice number, if you're dealing with a, a distance between left and center of 32 and then center and right of 14, uh, it's a little irregular. It's going to be probably impossible. Especially when you try to subdivide odd numbers. Exactly. Uh, and I actually I get to that in, in just a moment here. Uh, so if the entire width of, of the layout isn't divisible by some kind of same number, Good luck. Now, why do I say impossible? Uh, I don't want to discourage anybody from using a grid system, but we all know about CSS and having to override various attributes of elements. So what I mean by impossible is it's not worth the effort and it's not worth the extra stuff you have to download. 
because essentially what you'd be doing is putting the CSS framework out there and overriding everything in it. What's the point? Right, just like we're <laughs> every day, every day. So, implementing a grid will be difficult but not impossible if your layout has gutter widths of odd numbers. So if you have 15 pixels between gutters, uh, reason being, uh, 960 has 10 pixels on each side, so when you multiply any number by two, you get an even number. If you have an odd number, it's possible, and I can discuss that in a moment, but it becomes a headache and you lose the ability to, to very elegantly prevent collision with browser Chrome because you can't simply say, I have 10 on the left and 10 on the right. You may have to say, I have none on the left and 15 on the right, or five and 10, and then it gets a little complicated. So like I said, difficult but not impossible. If your site's layout is fluid, difficult but not impossible, there is a 960 fluid edition, uh, which is a little counterintuitive because it means it's not 960 pixels wide, but what it means is it's taking the conventions uh, established in 960 to allow sorting of uh, like the flow of divs and, and how wide things should, should be in comparison to the uh, current width. Okay. Yeah, it keeps the ratios intact. It keeps the ratios intact. That was made by a guy also smarter than me. <laughs> but that's, if you scroll to the bottom of the 960.js site, there's a, there's a link to the fluid version. Exactly. And bottom line, implementing a grid will be difficult, but not impossible if the site wasn't designed on a grid to begin with. Fitting something into a grid after the fact is always going to be difficult because as designers we know that we have very carefully established every pixel, every width. If we are beginning with those rules and we send it to a themer and the themer says, well, you gave me something that's 957 pixels, I need to make it 960 and you're going to need to adjust some pixels here and there, that's a real headache. You're generating a lot of extra work. Is it really worth it in the long run? How much is it going to cost? And that's why I made the, the Photoshop and Fireworks and all the designing templates so that, you know, I, 960 arose out of my frustration working with the designer that I didn't communicate with well enough, saying the client wants us to use Blueprint. He said, okay, I'll, I'll use a grid. Somehow Blueprint got lost and he had things aligned, but it was like 126 pixels wide for a sidebar. And like, so I ended up retrofitting his design, went into Photoshop, scoot, scoot, scooted everything around. And I was like, man, what am I doing? You know? So I, I thought to myself, if I ever do do a grid system, I want to have templates out there so that I don't have to, you know, nothing gets lost in communication. Just stick right. to this grid and I'll be able to code it quicker. And as mentioned, 960 GS and the 960 theme come with these templates that you can just lay uh, stuff out on. So you would have, uh, uh, you know, your Illustrator templates, your Photoshop templates, and, and so forth. So getting started with the 960 theme for Drupal, first of all, do not change the theme. Do not touch it. It's like Hacking Core. You want to sub-theme it. Don't touch it, because it may change, stuff may be added, and then you're going to have to upgrade. Not even underscores. That, that's right, exactly. Uh, so it's like Hacking Core. It's going to make upgrading really tough. Uh, so instead, you're going to want to either sub 960 or create an entirely new theme using 960 as sort of like the, the touchstone for everything that you want to do. Use it as the seed to grow something totally new. So let's talk about sub theming very quickly. Uh, this, this, is, this method is most efficient if you're using 12 or 16 columns because it's already defined in 960. Uh, there are some instructions up here, uh, sub theming quick and dirty. This is on triple.org. You can check this out later on. If you want to uh, build a new theme, it's best, uh, if your site layout is not 960 pixels wide, and if it doesn't use 12 or 16 columns, you probably don't simply want to sub-theme because you're gonna wind up overriding more CSS than you would have written in the first place. So just copy-paste, create a new theme, change the values. All right, uh, a little bit of math. Be prepared to deal with numbers if you're making your own theme, your own grid system that's not 960, 12 or 16 columns. The best thing to do is to create a spreadsheet where you can actually visualize these columns, margins, and gutters. So here's an example from a client um, that I'm working on right now. So here's the value for 960 GS. Uh, the purpose of this spreadsheet, by the way, is to establish the, the, um, the coordinate of the left-hand side of each of these things. So we wound up creating you know, four or five different spreadsheets that all had things like, what are the widths of a grid one, grid two, grid three, grid four across this custom grid? Uh, and all kinds of other calculations. This here is simply saying what's the left-hand point on the grid for each of these things. So 960 GS, you know, your little gutter on the left-hand side starts at zero and then it goes to 10, 70, 90, and so on. Uh, and then there are these other grids we had to build. Uh, the final version of this grid has to be 957 pixels wide, which does work, um, but you have odd gutter widths and that's uh, a real pain. Luckily, this client has specifically said they wanted to hit browser Chrome. I don't know. So the grid equation. 
Uh, you don't have to use this, but this just sort of explains how you can do it in one fell swoop. I'm not going to uh, bore you with it, but here's an example. As you can see, uh, for the 12 column layout, you get you know we're 16. MIT, so right. <laughs> and for the 16 column layout, you get 40. You can deconstruct that on your own time. Uh, okay, so here's some examples, and uh, you probably want to talk about these because these are these are Nathan's examples. Um, so this is my friend uh, Patrick Haney. He designed this site. Oh, oops. Oh, I think our overlay didn't come through, but it's okay. Um, you can kind of see through to the background. Um, this is Refresh Boston. Uh, Patrick is a web developer that works for Harvard. Um, but this is a, a local grassroots meetup. So for those of you from Boston, if you haven't heard of this, go check it out, refreshboston.org. Uh, ConvertBot, um, I think at WWDC won an Apple Design Award and, uh, for their app on the iPhone. But this is their site um, laid out using 960. Uh, this was a comp I did for Pepsi when I worked for EMC, uh, just to show kind of that, yes, we do sometimes use down to the very granular column level. This was a January through December. Um, they wanted an app that they could measure how many terabytes they were using for across all their sites and across all their you know, SQL servers and so forth. Um, this was a comp we did for the Army and Air Force Exchange Services. Um, I, my, I'm a military brat, so I filled it with stuff, like knowing all about the Army and Air Force and having worked for this, this shopping uh, center that they have on every Air Force base. And we actually won like a $5 million contract at EMC based on this and a few other comps because I took the time to write up, like, I'm Sergeant so-and-so and I love APs. And... Anyways, uh, Stop Design. Uh, this is Doug Bowman, formerly the lead designer at Google. Um, they created that position for him. He oversaw, I think, Google Calendar, um, like Google Spreadsheets, that type of thing. Got fed up with Google's kind of methodology and having to test 41 different colors of blue and having to have metrics, studies that he'd done on increasing something to four pixels from three pixels. So now he's at Twitter, which has like no <laughs> governance whatsoever. So that's kind of cool. But this is his personal site laid out on a, a 12 column grid. Uh, and then this is a site you might be familiar with, Drupal.org. Eventually we'll relaunch using a 12, 12 column grid uh, as well. So And uh, by the way, uh, shout out to uh, Morton, who actually. Uh, turned a lot of us on to 960 because he got into an argument about somebody as to whether we should use Blueprint or 960 to actually build the new Drupal.org, 961, and he put it all together. So, thank you. All right, a uh, quick case study. Uh, I'm going to go through this very quickly. It's the reason why, by the way, we're using our company website is it's the first thing we built on 960, and it's something we can actually show. So, here we go. Uh, it is a sub-theme. It's a proper sub-theme. It uses the 12-column version. Uh, here's an example blog post. You'll see that we actually utilize a fully blank column here to create a lot of separation between the content and the sidebar. Uh, so at the top here, we have header promos of grid 4, uh, right column of grid 3. We have content of grid 8, little gutter in the middle. Uh, one thing I, I do want to point out about the header promos across the top, what's neat about the grid system is that header promo area it can be totally configured on the fly. We have styles in place to create grid 1 ads, grid 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Uh, so we can drop in any kind of configuration sizes we want as blocks on the fly using the block class module, soon to be the Skinner module. And I think the sidebar that's uh, the, the grid 3, that, that is the size that is like the IAD standard it is sidebar ad size. So. Right, that is, that is the uh, uh, IED standard ad size. Okay, so here's the footer, and at the footer we have, you know, there's our content, our gutter, our right column. We have footer columns of three each, where we just dump some fun stuff, and we repeat the stuff from the top at the bottom. Okay, so uh, if you want to learn more about grids, here are some resources and interesting links. Again, you can download this from our website, website forkitchens.com slash presentations. That site, the grid system is thegridsystem.org. The grid the grid system system. Org. Just a wealth of information from everything from print to web. So it's a great resource. Here's uh, where you can download some of this stuff. Uh, and if you want to contact me, I'll... That's fine. Oh. Okay. Uh, and this presentation is Creative Commons licensed. So feel free to hack it as you see fit, uh, with the exception of some photos that we listed here. So uh, I guess we can start with questions. We have a few minutes left. So it seems like in a lot of ways, this ends up being uh, tables for CSS, in that you get a lot of that structured format. One of the things about tables that you could do was say that certain, certain columns would drop down 
Mm -hmm. And so the question is, do you have to, it doesn't seem like you can necessarily do that here, maybe I'm missing it, you have to predefine, when you want something to drop, you basically have to grid it out backwards so that the previous piece is a, is a bigger grid, that there's no way to say this piece is going to drop. Not necessarily, further you could dynamically add the class of like clear block and it would, it would drop it down regardless of whether or not there was still room for it to be on the same exactly. line. Exactly, exactly. Anything else? Yes? Um, does the grid generator work for Drupal? Like, if you generated a different grid? Um, so the question was, does the grid generator work for Drupal? Um, you would have to, one, you would have to create the push and pull classes, and you would also have to replace the underscores, because it's designed to work off the base 960. Uh, what I think I'm going to do is, once I fully wrap my head around all the push pull, is put that back into the 960, apart from Drupal, get that code to the guys that wrote the grid generator and help for, you know, help them to kind of wrap their heads around how to put that into the generator itself. Okay, Th this is uh, one of the things that's linked in um, the, uh, uh, the presentation. But just to give you a demonstration of this, it will create CSS for you on the fly. And you can just click download CSS file and it's got it there. Right. So this is good, like I've had friends say, I don't want the 16 column or I don't want the 12, I just want that and say, we'll go here Configure it just the way you want it and just download just that amount of columns. Has somebody done a panels layout that does 960 so you can effectively drop stuff in with with panels and get the 960 layout? Because, I mean, panels has got to be predefined, you know. Right. Uh, I, I haven't been keeping up with panels since panels 2. But uh, as far as I know, you just drop in the classes, grid, grid 2, grid 3, whatever. Uh, and as long as it can override whatever panels is sending it, or if panels is sending it nothing, hopefully, you, uh, it's just as simple as knowing my content area is uh, a grid eight, so I know that I can have up to eight things spanning a row. Uh, and then I need to remember to add alpha and omega to the first and last things in each row, and then I'll be fine. And three actually, uh, just fit out, put it out for different regions. So you can have to change, take the whole template, whatever you want for the it is sweet. Most in the back. Yeah, while you're making suggestions to these guys, the grid editor, can you have them put size of my own unit and have them output M instead of triple? Ah, 960 and, and M. Um, yeah, as long as you don't care about IE6, because its rounding <laughs> really sucks. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I could talk to them about it. And that well, it's, it's kind of up to them. Um, that's a little bit more heavy number crunching. That's like <laughs> MIT level stuff. But. Uh, so it's kind of above my head, but I can suggest it to him definitely. When you create one or more sub themes, is there a way of hiding the parent theme in your list of themes so the end user doesn't choose something that's not styled? Um, are you talking about like an authenticated user that has admin control? Well, the admin module did that, so. Oh, that's a tough one. Uh, you need I, need yeah, you, you, yeah, but once you have. Yeah, once you have permission to... to I think I saw a module that did that so that end users who get to choose their theme are only certain themes are enabled. Just, just again for the, for the yeah, recording, yeah, um, the question was, is it possible to hide the parent theme when you're choosing it in the admin area and only show the sub-theme? So for instance, if your client has full admin rights, they can't go messing up their site layout by choosing the parent theme instead. Um, and the answer was that there's probably a module for that. <laughs> but I couldn't remember the name. That's where you don't give the client admin access. <laughs> That's right. Any, anybody else? Yes? Can you see a good production quality requirement of a 960 fluid? There's a link to it. It looks really cool, actually. This wouldn't be production, this would be prototyping, but I mean, all the code here is, could be just reusable. It, it does, and that's something he's working on. Um, the guy that did this is big into um, Symphony 21, it's like CMS. Um, so you can see here it's resizing on the fly, keeping the ratios correct. And this also has MooTools included. Um, somebody that didn't like MooTools took it, repurposed this one, and then it became based on jQuery. So there's kind of pretty much every permutation out there. Um, Here's a... Um, uh, a nice little tool as well that's linked on the front page of 960 GS. It doesn't show up very well here. I need to adjust the colors on it. But it will uh, impose a grid over the layout. Uh, it's called the 960 Gritter. 
Um, we'll give you a you better change your color right there, actually. Yeah, it's actually it's, it's set to the proper color, but I think my style sheet is um, destroying it. Yeah. Uh, okay. So this is kind of cool because it will check. It'll say if the jQuery object exists. I know the jQuery is being called on the page already. It'll tap into jQuery from Drupal. If it doesn't exist, it will call jQuery in from Google Code to enable it to do its work. Yeah, and this is one of the things you drag into your uh, uh, bookmark bar, and you just click. It's just a call to JavaScript. So you can, on the fly, see like, hey, I wonder if this is, you know, 12 column or whatever. It also gives you some uh, uh, vertical um, rhythm uh, for the uh, line heights there. Uh, that's, uh, I think, a discussion for uh, another session. But uh, if you really, really need to uh, take a look at the typography and how it's laid out vertically on a site, this little gritter thing just throws that in there for you. Yeah, go to alistapart.com and then do Google search for, um, like, vertical rhythm. Actually, um when you go to each one of these, if you could do the groovy, I don't know if you have it enabled, but you can hold down command and option, hit plus, and zoom in on the URL so people can get yeah. it. It has to be enabled in uh, system. Oh, it's the accessibility yeah. feature? Yeah, it's accessibility. I don't think I know that. Well, anyway, at alistapart.com. Okay. I'm sure we're fairly familiar with that website. Um, that's being slower now. But anyway, uh, yeah, just search for vertical rhythm to get some ideas on He also that. had a. Um, there's also an article on the list of part about fluid grids as well. Okay. Uh, I think the W3, there, there was an agency that was working on the redesign of W3.org, and they had said, we have to have a grid, and it has to be fluid. And the designer was like, what? You know? So he wrote about his experience and how he went about doing that. Mm -hmm. so, cool. Anything else? All right. Thank you very much. Thank you.